And good morning, everybody. As usual, Emma has done a stellar job picking slides for us this morning. So um, Kim, I suppose if you officially advance to the welcome and announcements. There's not a whole lot of announcements except to say, uh, hopefully everybody either has read their email version of the newsletter or will receive it in the mail in the next day or two. The events on the 21st of November have sadly been postponed until the uh, spring because we just don't feel like it's going to be safe to have people coming in and out of the building. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to really promote those and do it in a safer way and that kind of thing. And there's lots and lots of news about um, Advent stuff coming and then there'll be a separate uh, sort of list for pageant stuff and advent wreaths and sign up sheets for decorating and that kind of thing so that we can do as many things as possible in a way that somewhat resembles traditional normal advent things in this pandemic time. I don't have any other announcements this morning. Then let us go forward with our worship service. Hear these centering words of gratitude from we are called to be God's people. <clears throat> we are called to be God's prophets, speaking for the truth and right, standing firm for godly justice, bringing evil things to light. Let us seek the courage needed, our high calling to fulfill, that the world may know the blessing of doing God's will. And now let us pray together. You, our God, are a mighty fortress, and we can rely on you. In our struggles against all the evils of this world, no evil can stand in the full force of your love. We know that we cannot withstand the powers of evil, except that we stand in the protection of your love from age to age and our faith in your love made flesh to dwell among us, Jesus Christ. All the power of Satan himself cannot shake us. We shall not fear for hate and the very gates of hell will tremble and fall in hearing of a single word. That word is love and through that love comes the spirit with every gift and grace we need to win the final battle. Crowns and thrones may perish, countries rise and wane. Through countless ages, your truth and love abide. Amen.
So we have reached the end of the story. And um, I just want to remind everybody that my goal was to have us do an all church music video. And I know many of you are a little skeptical about that for the simple fact that, you know, music videos aren't necessarily a thing that we do in our brand of Christianity. But um, it's a great way to celebrate. The song is fun. It's one that anybody over the age of 35 probably knows from dances at school and who knows, maybe even people younger than 35 will know it. I will post, um, send out the lyrics to it and um, re-up the video to it. You can sing to it, you can dance to it, you can be as goofy as you wanna be. It's a celebration. Um, and I'd really like to be able to play it next week in worship. So um, hopefully we'll get some good contributions to it and uh, we'll be able to celebrate all the hard work that so many people put into it, especially Dick and Peter. So without further ado, Spies, Lies, and Moses Dies. Previously on the wilderness, baby boy, shepherd out in the wilderness, tending his sheep, burning bush. Burning bush was God. Burning bush said, go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no, no, no. When the Nile runs red. No, no, no. No, no, no. Pharaoh said yes. Moses led the people out of Pharaoh's hand all the way to the promised land with a few stops between, like having to cross the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army coming after him. Oh my goodness gracious. But all of Pharaoh's army wound up doing the dead man's floats. You can't really complain too much about that. The next stop was Mount Sinai, where Moses went to the top of the mountain and received lots of thou shalls and thou shalt nots. Moses went down the mountain with the tablets containing the Ten Commandments, only to find the people worshipping a golden calf. That really made him mad. What are you doing? What is this idol? What is this thing you've built? You know you're not supposed to do this. God doesn't want this. I've wasted my time for nothing yelled at the people and then had to go talk God out of killing everybody, which was very successful. And in the process, Moses even got to see God's backside. The people complained a lot. They got quail. They still weren't satisfied. But guess what? God kept loving them. Moses kept leading them. And that leads us to the exciting conclusion of the wilderness. Now, you're probably thinking that we covered 35 of the 40 years over the last four weeks, because a lot has happened. The plague, the mad dash across the Red Sea, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Calf. But did you know the Israelites could have been settling in the Promised Land, the land of milk and honey, in just a little more than two years? When we left Moses, he was returning to the people after talking with God again. God continued to lead the people with a pillar of cloud by day and protect them with a pillar of fire by night, right up to the very edge of Canaan, the promised land, just a short while later. And this is where we find Moses and the people now. Behold, Moses! Oh, no, not again. The promised land is before you. Moses, you are standing on the threshold of the land of milk and honey. Looks like desert to me. Ah, Moses, you are to gather the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel to go forth into the promised land and report back to you. All 12 of them? Yes, Moses, all 12. All right. Send them forth. Okay. All right, all 12. You know who you are, go. Find this place, report back to me what it's like. And then I'll tell God what you've found. Doo, 
Okay, everybody's back. What did you find? What do you mean there's giant people there? Armies. This is supposed to be milk and honey. All you gotta do is walk in and take what you want. Army? Really? Come on. No? Okay. Uh, they found the promised land. And as usual, it's not what you said. And there's, uh, there's big people there, there's giants, there's armies. So now we have to fight a war to get the milk and honey. You know, they're telling me they wish they stayed in Egypt. There that was bad, but not this bad. Charlton, I mean Moses, yeah. I picked you, and yet you continue to question me. You believe your people before myself. I see them every day. Moses, I know these people. I've known them for years. Moses, I have said repeatedly, trust in me. For two years, we walk in the desert. Moses, I don't want to hear it. birds and men are in, you know. Moses, I have grown incredibly angry with you. Hey, what do you want from me? I, be, I got them on my case, I get you on my case. Everybody's on my case. Moses, I need you to trust in me. Moses, I'm completely disgusted. Well, I'm not happy either. Moses, I told you day one, not me. From Everybody this day me. forth, you yeah. shall wander into the desert, and this generation that cannot believe in me shall perish before going to the promised land. You should have left us in Egypt. We would have perished here. It wouldn't have been half the trouble. I am done with you, Moses. Go forth into the desert. All right. Been real. All right, I'm back. The desert wasn't good. Can we have another chance? Can I have another chance? They're mad at me, you're mad at me. I don't dare go home because you'll be mad at me. Lord, hey. Moses. Do you now understand the meaning of faith? Yes, yeah, sort of. Moses, I shall once again deliver you the life sustenance of water. Well, that's great because we don't have any. We haven't had any. We're on the desert, you know. Moses, once again, you will be my instrument to your people. Okay, now what this time? You see no water before you? No, I see desert. I see sand. Cactus. Moses, you are to take your rod and in one stroke, one stroke only, strike the rock and my power will become evident. Strike the rock. Can't you do anything simple? Moses. You do bugs, you do this, you open the waters when we could have had a boat. You could have given us a brisket and bagels and blitzes when we could have had food. And now, why, do, why a rock? Why can't we have a nice little, a little, uh, little well or a little, uh, what about a stream? What about a pretty little country stream where... So you're saying you do not want the water very well, if no, that is no, the case. No, 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 I don't go there, but, you know, these people need to take a bath. Oh boy, they need to take a bath. They've been out in the desert for two years. Moses, do what I command here. or don't do what I command. Well, wait a minute, listen, It's in listen, your hands. I am through. Me. Dad, listen to me. You know, these people need a bath. The women need to wash their hair. The kids need a stream to, stream to play in. They all have little rubber duckies. They want to float down the stream. And all you want me to do is whack this rock, and I'll get a little water coming out. Okay. Yeah, I got water. Oh, wow, it's a lot of water. Got sand in it. Too bad I didn't have fluoride for our teeth. Moses. Yeah? I have given you water. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. That is all I ask, Moses. Unfortunately, as I have commanded, those Israelites in the generation that would not believe me and cast their beliefs into idols beyond me will not see the promised land. After all this? But Moses, 
I shall impart something upon you. Okay, this is going to be good. Moses, you have been a faithful servant caught in the middle. But Moses, I shall allow you to live, but see the promised land, but you will not set forth forth for, for that. Sorry, Moses. That's God, you better put your teeth in. But Moses, you shall see the promised land. I can see it, but I can't go. All right. Sorry, Moses, you are alone that your wife had passed away. Yeah, I mean, that was rough. I had to learn how to cook. Perhaps, Moses, I can send you a companion in the meantime. Somebody young? Indeed. Perhaps someone, someone by the name of Andrea. Hey, that sounds interesting. I shall make it so, Moses. Uh, you right. shall wander forth, but you shall eventually see the promised land. All right, that sounds good. Once I told you a hundred times, I was always between you and them. I know, Moses. Because of that, you're going to be able to see the promised land, but not be able to set foot, foot, foot in it. Well, that's nice. Forty years in the desert, you give me the only piece of land that has no oil, and now you tell me I can't be part of it? I'm sorry. So I did all of this for nothing? In the meantime, Moses, come with me. All right. That's the end of the story of Moses, but it's definitely not the end of our story. Joshua, son of Nun, has an entire book named after him because of what happens next, but that is for another time. We left out a lot of stuff as we told this story. We left out pages and pages of detailed instructions from God about decorating the tabernacle, the tent of worship the people carried with them for 40 years. We didn't include chapter after chapter after chapter of census information that makes up a good chunk of the book of, wait for it, Numbers. There were a lot of laws about how to apologize for doing wrong. Those laws involved sacrificing animals something neither our Jewish siblings nor we do anymore. So we skipped over them. We even skipped over a story about a talking donkey. But that might show up at another time. What we did not skip was the relationship that Moses had with God. Moses trusted God enough to be honest when he thought God was wrong and to do things he thought weren't going to work just because God said to do them. And God loved Moses so much that God listened when Moses complained. God even changed the plans and did not kill everyone for worshiping the golden calf when Moses said it was wrong. Even though most of us don't encounter God speaking to us on mountaintops today, we can still have that kind of loving, trusting relationship with God. Jesus showed us how, and so have countless other people in history. Like Moses, Jesus and so many others knew that God would always be there for them. God would always listen to them, and God would always love them. To that I say, yea and amen.
So one of the things that is true coming out of the wilderness and parts of a substantial part actually of the laws that Moses received and passed on to the people during the time in the wilderness was about taking care of each other and defining who the other was. And it was quite clear to the leaders of the Jewish people at the time of Jesus that the other was all inclusive. So when Jesus taught about taking care of each other and taking care of neighbors and friends and whatnot, he was very expansive in that. We see that in the Good Samaritan story. And we also see this here in this passage. It's usually reserved for Reign of Christ Sunday or Christ the King Sunday in year A. But I thought it was particularly appropriate when we're talking in our Stewardship Sunday series about the missions and ministries that the church does. So here are these words from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then the king will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So clearly I was in the rhyming mood when I was setting this sermon up because I called it a base and a space for God's grace. <sighs> Sometimes I should revisit my sermon titles. This morning we're talking about building and missions. And it seems like an odd combination at first, except that the building is really a home base. And I have said this a couple of times in meetings before, one of the things that impresses me about this congregation is that you don't have an edifice complex. So you're not so bound to the building that things are impossible when you can't be there collectively. It's a home base for the things that you do, but it's not the only place or space where things can happen. And that's very impressive. It's a very mature attitude to have because so many churches are so hamstrung by their buildings, either because they've let it 
be the end all be all of their giving or because they can't imagine doing anything that isn't in that place. And in fact, I know churches that are not currently worshiping together in any way, shape or form because they can't be in their buildings. And so their thinking is, what's the point? But that doesn't mean that the building's not important because the building is a space that allows this congregation to be in ministry. And when I think about all the groups that are not able to meet, now some of them can't meet because they're mandated not to by their own governing bodies. Some of them would like to meet when we can figure out a way to make it safer for them. And you know when it's safe to do so and legal. Um, but they wouldn't necessarily have a place to meet without the church's building. So taking care of the building is an important factor of the mission work that the church does. And in fact, I think it's healthy to think of the building as a tool for missions and a tool for outreach rather than the place that the church is. So as you're thinking about your stewardship this year, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that needs to be done at the church. And if I were there this morning, I would have taken pictures. And you know, in those moments when you think, why didn't I take the pictures when I had the camera out every Friday I've been at the building? Or, oh my God goodness, how did I forget that the sun was going down at five o'clock instead of six o'clock this week? Um, I was going to take a picture of the window on the outside, that even though it's been painted, it's still obviously broken. And then the damage on the inside from the window there. And some of the places where things just need to be updated and spruced up. Now, the good news is that the Southern New England Conference has a missions-based grant available for churches that are working to make build their buildings more accessible during and post COVID time. And so a group of us will be working on that grant. We're gonna be looking at the possibility of getting some air uh, cleaning systems for different spaces. Um, we're probably gonna look to see what else needs to be done for safety and usability and that kind of thing is the minimum grant is $5,000. And I think we could probably come up with a fairly substantial um, number of things to do for that. So that will help. But the upkeep of the building is a piece of missions. And I think if we adjust our mindset to that, it makes it so much easier to see the building as a gift instead of an albatross, which is helpful and also as a place where amazing things happen. Amazing things like preparing for the soup kitchen. And I know it's not the same as cooking in this, in this kitchen or you know, being able to even use the building at the Baptist church as their tool for mission. And it's weird to be doing takeout for the soup kitchen, but the space is available for us to assemble those meals and to take them over and to help feed people who otherwise would go hungry. The space is available for Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts to shape young leaders of this country who will go on to do great things. The space is available for AA and for other groups that are allowing people to work through their issues and to become healthy, contributing members of society. I'm not even sure what all the groups are that meet in the church because they haven't been meeting since I've been there. But think about what the um, coffee house does. You don't think of it necessarily as a mission, but how many people have had the opportunity to really work on the gifts that they've been given and to hone their talents that can then go on to bring joy to people? That's a mission. Yeah, you might help pay some bills from it, but it's still a mission. Think about all the ways that church groups help each other out. Think about the joy we get from singing in the choir and playing in the handbell choir. You know, yeah, acapella is great because it allows us to sing this way, but I got to tell you, I had to re-record the alto line on both hymns this week 
because it was so much better singing with everybody than it was singing to myself on a cappella. That's the joys of being the one that assembles everything at the end. I got to sing with the whole choir. Missions, this notion that we're supposed to care for each other is such an essential part of our Christian identity that when we do these things, we're truly, truly witnessing for the power of God's love in the world. And Jesus knew this and he called us to this so that we would always be witnessing and always be sharing God's love. Poor Moses, when he was conveying to the people what God had said, had no idea how he was witnessing to people. And even though I know he felt like he failed more than he succeeded, we wouldn't be here today if he hadn't succeeded. Because the generation that did settle the promised land remembered God's love for them. And generation after generation after generation, all the way down through Christ's generation, remembered God's love for them. And then the generations that have sustained Judaism, that have sustained Christianity, and that ultimately gave birth to Islam have remembered God's love. And even though each religion expresses it a little differently, it's all based in the same love that God has for each and every one of us. So keep doing the missions and think carefully during this stewardship season about how what we give can foster more missions, can foster more outreach, can empower the church to find and help more people encounter God's love and know the power of that transformation from a humdrum life into something that is glorious and uplifting and that can sustain even through the deepest tragedies. Thank you for all you've done Thank you for all you will continue to do long into the future. And may your contemplations on your giving this year be joyful and not a, ugh, the building. Because it's not an, ugh, the building. It's, oh, we have a great space to do great works in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. We come to the prayer time this morning when we can turn to our God who loves us so, so completely and so unconditionally and who calls us to pray for one another and for each and every child of God. And in particular, we remain in prayer for all those who are affected by COVID-19, including many of our own congregation members and their family members right now. We pray for wisdom and guidance for all those who are working for treatments and for vaccines for COVID. We pray for those who are hopeful that they can go back to their programs to eradicate other diseases such as polio, and tuberculosis that have begun to climb again as shutdowns and other things have affected those programs around the world. We're mindful that there is yet another hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, that the people in Cuba have been affected by it, that folks in Nicaragua and other parts of Central America uh, experienced very heavy rains and flooding and wind from that, and that Florida may be in some part of the bullseye of that. We're thankful for a thus far peaceful election season and for hope and wisdom among everyone who is in leadership around the world, but especially here in the United States for the faculty and staff and students and parents at every level of school <clears throat> who are still wondering 
when the next time will be that they're not able to be in a classroom or when they might go back to a classroom. And we continue to hold those who are still working on the election because there's still counting going on. There will be recounts, there will be court challenges. And that is hard work. And it's not something to be taken for granted because it is the first line of defense for the democratic rights that allow us to operate as a country. We pray for David O'Connor, who is probably facing surgery, and for Betty. Are there other prayer requests this morning? Let us pray. God of great love, who calls us to have compassion on one another, to assure that our neighbors have their basic needs met, and who asks us to have compassion on ourselves because you love us so. We are thankful for the long line of faithful people from the Garden of Eden right through to today who have heard your call to them, who have responded, and who have shown us how to be in relationship with you and who have taught us how to love one another as you love us and as we love ourselves. Because of that love, we are confident when we call upon you to pay heed to all those we have lifted up, whether by name or condition. We know that what we say out loud is already in your knowing. And further, we know that those things that we hold in the depths of our hearts that we cannot express are known to you and held dear to you because they concern us. And so we lift them to you in this time of silent prayer. God of the Incarnation, we gather in prayer and with people everywhere in this world who know you and love you. We pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
now let us bless each other as we say our benediction and prepare to join together in our coffee hour. Go on your way in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help and cheer the sick. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. Be well, be safe, be strong. And may the blessing of God be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. <laughs>